And indeed, if you if you think about what we do as the church, like when we come together in these moments and we sing these songs, we're we're singing about the treasure we found. We're singing about the hope and the promise that we have in Christ that we have nowhere else. It's like we come to this one source, this one place to bring hope, to find hope, to share in hope. And we come from all different places. If you look around this room, like we don't look like each other. We have different levels of money in our bank accounts. We came here in different kind of cars. We're going to go home to different places, and we do different jobs and different careers. And in some ways, we have philosophical different ideas about some things in our culture and in our community, but we all share the cross. We all share this invitation, this treasure that has been found in Christ and in Christ alone. And so when we come, we come from the brokenness of all that mess out there, and we come to this place of unity, this place of grace where, where grace abounds and mercy is to be found prominent and prevalent in all that we do as a people. And so this is what we're proclaiming in this message series, this this proclamation that the church is called to something that the world desperately needs. And it's beautiful when we get it right. So as we turn our attention to the word in just a moment, it's going to be a time where we gather again around the teaching for the church to be that representation of that reconciling movement that the world so desperately needs. So let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the invitation that's been given to come and sit at your table. And Father, you've looked at us in all of our brokenness and all of our sin and still called us your children. And we're so thankful, Father, that you have seen us beyond the weight of our sin, beyond the weight of what we consider our rebellion. And, and you've, you have brought us into your family, into your kingdom, and given us an eternal hope, an eternal promise that goes so far beyond our own personal brokenness. And it brings us into this collective tapestry of something beautiful that you're creating, and it's a, a story you're writing. It's a story of grace. It's a story of peace. It's a story of reconciliation. And so, Father, thank you for giving us a role to play and for inviting us into your story. And as we turn our attention, Father, to the word this morning, we pray that it illuminates us, that it challenges us, that it encourages us. In every way, Father, may you be glorified by our time here together and our response to this moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can be seated this morning. Jesus belongs to Africa as much as he does to Europe and Asia. He was born in that part of the world that touches Africa and Asia and Europe, and Jesus was not a white man like me, nor was he as black as some of you. Don't ever say it's a white man's religion or a black man's religion. It's a world religion. He belongs to the world. One of my favorite bumpers we've ever done, and uh, I told them they could just play this at my funeral. This will be the thing that I want to go out on, right? Um, I have a cousin named Buddy, and Buddy has had problems with his hips and knees and all kinds of stuff. He's older than me. I know you're thinking, I know you're old, Paul, but, like, he's even older than me. I mean, he's, like, 15 years older than me. And so, like, he had a hip problem, and so they replaced his hip several years back, and that got that better. And then eventually he developed a problem with his knee on the other side, and he was hurting so bad, hurting for, for years, and would go to doctor after doctor, and they would look at it. they tried try to solve the problem with therapy and all kinds of different treatments and everything for his knee, trying to fix his knee. And eventually he got tired of dealing with all those doctors, and he went back to his hip doctor. And he says, hey, man, I got this problem with my knee. Can you help me with my knee? And he did the x-rays. He did the tests. He looked at everything, and he came into him, he said, look, you don't have a knee problem, you got a hip problem. And he's like, if I replace the other hip, he said, it'll fix your knee. And my cousin was like, are you serious? He's like, yeah. He said, your, hip, your knees look beautiful. He said, you got great knees. He said, the problem is your hip. He said, your knee's trying to compensate and it's creating pain in that place. He said, so if you'll let me replace your hip, then it'll fix your knee. He said, my hip's not hurting. He said, but that's where your problem is. And so my cousin said, well, can I be awake during the during surgery? 
Because <laughs> that's the kind of guy he is. I'm just, that's, that's a little side note there. It has nothing to do with the illustration. But it's just funny to me that he wanted to stay awake during his hip replacement surgery. And the doctor, was, of course, was like, no. But he had the hip replaced, and guess what? It fixed his knee. It's great. Like, he has no more knee pain because he fixed his hip. You see, a lot of times we look at the division around us, and we, try to, might, we might try to fix it with systems and protests and, and processes and elections and, and all these kinds of things. And we're looking at these, the, the symptoms, and we try to deal with the symptoms and try to figure out what really is going on is we have a heart problem. And it's, it's if we can correct our heart towards each other, then all of those divisions just kind of go away and they mean nothing. And we don't need all the systems because then I begin to see you like I see me. And if I see you like I see me, then we're going to be at peace with each other. And if the church would ever understand this, like the, 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 the perpetuation of the racial and the cultural divide by the church is one of the most sinful things that the church is doing. And it, and it drives me crazy that we still do this. And I know it's one of the things that's, that's, dr that's been driving me ever since I went into the ministry is how do we solve this problem that the church is perpetuating, this, this division along cultural boundaries, because it, to me, it just simply does not represent the reconciling nature of what the gospel of Jesus Christ teaches us. So how do we do this? We have to fix our hearts. It's a heart problem. Last week, we asked the question, hey, can we begin to look at the labels we're putting on people? And can we acknowledge that those labels are sinful? Because those labels always come with some kind of prejudices about what those people are just by simply looking at different people that look different than us. And we say, okay, well, those people always do this. Those people always do this. You're one of those people. And that's sinful. Because Jesus doesn't look at us that way. And so when Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, I want to remind you of this church, this church that Paul is writing to in this whole series that we're looking at is from the book of Ephesians, and he's writing this, this, this letter to this church that is a multicultural church. And so like multiculturalism in the church is ancient, it's not new. But we are like, oh man, that's great that churches are doing that out there, that's so special. I never knew that that was even possible. No, it was originally possible. It was probable because the expectation was that they would go into a city where nobody had heard of Jesus, and they would go to the synagogue first, and they would try to preach to the Jews, and then they would go out into the community, and they would start telling everybody there about the hope that they have in Jesus. And, and Jesus had called Saul, who now is Paul, to, to literally be the apostle to the Gentiles. In other words, this, was initial, this multiculturalism was Jesus' idea. He actually set somebody specifically apart, like, that's your job. And he picked the most Jewish person that he could find, the Hebrew of Hebrews, a former Pharisee who hated Gentiles all his life, and now he's the one that's supposed to lead the movement to reach the Gentiles. Jesus had a passion for a multicultural movement that would be represented by his church. He said, he said this is my ecclesia, my church. And so this church in Ephesus is a representation of that. There's people from all walks of life. There's Jew, there's Gentile. There's people from also all different levels of culture and society, whether they were business people, whether they were free, whether they were slave, whether they were whatever. They're all in this church together as a representation of the multiculturalism and the diversity in their community as now coming into the church. So the church is a true representation of their neighborhood and of their community. And it blows people's minds that all the people from all different walks are now in this same room, in, under this same movement, serving this same king. And it doesn't make sense to them. So we're going to read Ephesians 2, 14 through 19 as we continue our journey through this letter. And we talked last week about the labels we put on people and how sinful and unhealthy that is and the division that it perpetuates. Today, listen to what we find out from Paul as he continues to unpack this theology of multiculturalism in the church. He said, for he, Jesus himself, is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. 
And he came and preached to you who were far off, peace, peace, preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are now fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Key point number one is that Jesus is our peace. Not that Jesus teaches us peace or Jesus brings us peace. Those are true. But the essence of what Paul is saying is know that Jesus is our peace. Jesus literally is the peace. He is not a representation of peace. He is the peace. And only in Jesus can we have peace. And Paul's specifically talking about peace between the Jews. He says our peace As a Jewish man talking to Gentiles, he said, Jesus is our peace. Jesus is the bridge between me as a Jew and you as a Gentile. Between me as a black man, me as a white man, me as a a female, me as a man, me as a Hispanic, whatever it is. like Jesus is the peace that bridges all of those divisions that the walls want to build. Me as a Democrat, me as a Republican, right? Like It's it's all of that. Like Jesus is the peace for all of that. And he is the essence of it himself. It's like the whole story about, like, you know, in a, in a bacon and egg breakfast, the chicken makes a contribution, but the pig makes a commitment, right? You know? And so it's like the, the chicken is contributing to the breakfast, but the pig gave everything. The pig is the breakfast, right? The essence of the pig is represented in the bacon, and there's no, I mean, the pig gave all, right? <laughs> so that we might have some. That's so beautiful for that pig to do that. Amen. Amen. I mean, is there anything better than bacon frying in a pan? Whoo, Lord. I'm just saying. Like, so in other words, what, that's what, that's what he, Paul is saying about Jesus. It's not, not like he's contributing to peace. Jesus is peace. He literally is the physical representation, the spiritual representation of what peace looks like. There is no conflict in Jesus. There's no turmoil in Jesus. There's no animosity in Jesus. It's peace because Jesus is God. He's the fulfillment of everything God is. And God has has desired for us to be at peace with him, even though we want to war against him in our sin. Jesus is our peace. He's the peace between us and God. And so we want to be at battle with God. The scripture says literally we were enemies of God before we became followers of Jesus. And so there's, if we're enemies, then we should be at war with each other. But Jesus comes and he is the peace. Like He literally is the peace by his sacrifice, his pure offering of grace. Then he becomes the peace between us and God. He also, that's that, that upward motion that we talk about here at Quest. And then the, the outward motion and the inward motion is us in relationship with other human beings, right? We talk about being a church in motion, and that outward and inward motion is about how we are also at peace with each other. And our peace with each other should impact our outward motion and how we impact the world. Because people look at us and say, man, that's crazy. What that church is doing. There's people from all different walks of life at that place. That's different. Pastor Doran Gray, who uh, leads the Transformation Church in the Charlotte, South Carolina area, that is kind of the, the marker for what we've been trying to do. In a lot of ways, they've kind of set the pace in a lot of ways, and he's leading our small group curriculum right now through video. It's fantastic what, what, he's, what his teaching is. Their church baptized 200 people last weekend. Yeah. And in that baptism service, there was people that... <laughs> that had brown skin, white skin, black skin, who spoke all kinds of different languages. Like, it, it just, like this, the, it's the beautiful, perfect representation of this tapestry that God is building. If you think about what a tapestry is, essentially it's a bunch of different fabrics that in some way are torn or broken or ripped or cut from another piece, and they're brought together. And, and individually they kind of look tattered and a little bit rough and maybe a little bit worn. But when you put them together in the right way with the skilled craftsman, they create this image and this beautiful tapestry. Like it's, it's precious and it's beautiful. It becomes priceless. It becomes valuable. 
But alone, the individual pieces make nothing. And so what we're trying to do in our culture a lot of times is we want to cut the tapestry apart. Okay, all the little green pieces, you need to be over here. All the red pieces, you need to be over here. All the blue pieces, you need to be over here. And we want to create these divisions and separations. But the gospel says, no, we are one tapestry. He himself is our peace. So peace between God, peace between others, and then internal peace. Jesus is our peace, this emotional peace that we have. Like the scripture talks about, do not be anxious, do not be afraid, don't worry. Like all this kind of stuff, this language that Jesus uses over and over and over again. He says, look, I'm the vine, you're the branches, we're interconnected. There's this familial relationship. God loves me, I love you, God loves you. Like it's this whole sense of community and this unwavering sense of peace that Jesus brings. It's like Psalm 23, he leads me beside the still waters, right? The quiet waters. Like he's the shepherd that understands that we as sheep are too nervous to drink from a moving body of water, right? So he creates a pool, a little, little dam, and makes a little pool so it's quiet. So us skittish, nervous sheep can have a place to drink from where we're comfortable. In John 14, Jesus says this about peace. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus is saying, I'm your peace. And this is, a, this is right before he promises us the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when we give the gift of the Holy Spirit, that's, that's, the, that's what Jesus is offering us that gives us a peace that's, in, that's internal but also has an eternal connection. And it's that peace that we get like, the, like Jesus offers us, nothing like the, the world can't give you the Holy Spirit. But Jesus can. And he says, this is the peace that I'm going to leave with you. And then later in John chapter 16, verse 33, he says this about peace. He says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have what? Peace. In the world you will have what? Tribulation. So you see the contrast there? He says, in me you have peace, in the world you have tribulation. In me you have peace, in the world you have tribulation. But we keep trying to find our peace in the world, right? If I can just get that promotion. If I can just make her fall in love with me, if I can just get that man, right? If I can just have a kid, if I can just get a, a, a raise at work, if I can just win the lottery, right? We put our, our hope in the peace of the world all the time. If, man, oh, if this candidate can just get elected president, then everything's going to be right for the rest of all eternity, right? And we got people acting like that. We got Christians acting like that, putting their hope in things that aren't eternal. Jesus said, in me you have peace, in the world you have tribulation. Why do we keep chasing after the world instead of chasing after Jesus? He says, but take heart. I've overcome the world. In other words, everything that you find that's a mess in this world, don't worry, I've overcome that. So what does this mean? If, if he's our peace, then what does he also offer? What, what's the result of it? The result is that, key point number two, Jesus offers complete reconciliation. Complete reconciliation. Not partial, not temporary, complete. Man, somebody's having a good time out there. <laughs> um, <laughs> by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, therefore thereby killing the hostility. What Paul is writing about is this dividing wall of hostility. I just get this imagery whenever I read that of like two people sitting across a footing Right? And there's, there's block on either side, and there's mortar, and there's a trial, and then there's a sledgehammer. Right? And you can either be putting mortar on a trial and building a wall while you're just staring down somebody. You want to build that wall up between you and them. Or you can take that sledgehammer and be trying to tear it down. And so a lot of times we got people walking around with, with mortar on their trials, and they get on social media. And, man, they just start building walls. 
Social media perpetuates this wall building like you have no idea, like it's just, because people can hide behind, right? If I'm sitting in the room with you and I disagree with you, we might have a conversation. But if I'm on social media and I disagree with you, we can have a conflict. And it can escalate into something that's unhealthy and ungodly and sinful. But this dividing wall that Paul's writing about was a literal wall in the temple, so, like, up until this point, like, like, later the temple would ultimately be destroyed, but there was this literally a wall, and, and archaeologically we've, we've proven this, that there was literally a wall that, that, that had a sign on it that says, if you're a Gentile and you go beyond this wall, you can be put to death. In other words, only the Jews get to go back to the special place. You see, God had set apart the Jews, and he had set them apart for the purpose of blessing the whole world. He had given them a ministry instead of giving them, like, special treatment. They weren't looked at as better than everybody else. They were looked at as having a responsibility to everybody else. And yet sin had created this sense of superiority in their mindset at this point, right, Many of them looked at anybody other than, if they were other than, they looked at them as somebody less than. And so this dividing wall literally kept the Gentiles from actually entering into the closer presence of God. But even, even that, like if you were just a Jewish person and you went, like there were certain places that women couldn't go, and then only the Jewish men could go, and then only the priests could go, and then there was places where only the high priests could go. And so these limitations, these dividing walls. And so when Jesus died on the cross and the veil was ripped, it also, the Spirit of God was unleashed. It also ripped the veil, but it tore down that wall too. And Paul is saying that the, the ministry of Jesus basically ripped that wall down. And so there is no more difference. There is no more division. We are the same. I've been reconciled to you. It's complete. You see, I can have peace with you but not be reconciled to you. I can, I can disagree with you and just be at peace, but, man, we're not really in deep relationship. And we get, we're at peace with each other, but we're not reconciled. Reconcile means actually we can be in relationship with each other. I began to trust you. We're reconciled. It's a complete reconciliation. And so what Jesus has offered us is a complete reconciliation between us and God. And then that, that reconciliation should pass from us and our understanding of that upward reconciliation into all of our relationships. Because if you've been reconciled to God then why wouldn't you want to reconcile to everybody else or represent reconciliation in all of your relationships? It should be the bellwether of who we are as the people of God. It should, it should be at the core of who we are. And so when the church basically lives in unreconciled splendor with black churches, white churches, Hispanic churches, and we, we gather in these separate groups all the time. And we might get together in the community to die, like have an outreach or whatever. But then we go back to our separate places. And the world looks at that, and they don't see reconciliation in that because that's the message. The message is that we're not even reconciled to each other. you got to think about what you're saying versus what you're actually communicating. Sometimes the words coming out of your mouth don't make any difference because what you actually do communicates more so than what comes out of your mouth. And so if we stand up in our pulpits and we proclaim reconciliation, but we're proclaiming it to people that all look like us, what are we actually communicating? What's actually being said? What does the world actually see? You see, the church should lead in this. Why do I know that? It's because we've been given a ministry of reconciliation. It's right here in the Bible. Listen to me. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 19, Paul's writing to another church. He says, look, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Did you hear that? We regard no one according to the flesh. In other words, I, can't make, I should not make any determinations about you based on what you look like, about what your accent is, about what your language is. That's, that's all fleshly stuff. He says, like, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. In other words, Jesus actually walked among us, and we actually regarded, regarded him according to the flesh. But then eventually, death, resurrection, like we realized who he was. And so we don't, reconcile, we don't regard him that way anymore. And so if he's gone before us, then we don't, we don't regard each other that way either. 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us what? A ministry of what? Read it. Reconciliation. It better be up there. Yeah, it's up there. (laughs) Gave us a ministry of reconciliation. Right? Like this is the ministry that we've been given. We hadn't been given a ministry of division. We hadn't been given a a ministry of segregation. We've been given a ministry of reconciliation. That's what our responsibility is. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Like Billy said, he belongs to the world, right? It's awesome. Not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of, of reconciliation. So we have a ministry of reconciliation and a message of reconciliation. It's like, like my son Brock and uh, Brandon's son Zeke, along with Micah, they, they have determined they, they're going to call themselves the Burger Boys, and they're on a quest to find the best burger in our area. And so they're going to all these joints that, that proclaim that they have great burgers, and so they're going and testing all their burgers. And their ministry to me is that when they find the right one, they're going to come and tell me, right? <laughs> I don't have to go spend my money on bad burgers. I just need to wait for them to find the good burgers and then come and tell me. And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful setup for me. <laughs> but see, you understand, like, once they've experienced something that's amazing, they have now a, a ministry of that to other people. And once we've experienced reconciliation with God and reconciliation with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, now we have a ministry of reconciliation to others as well. Like that's, so if the, if the church is not representing this, we're literally not doing our job. And there's all kinds of ways in which we've created dividing walls of hostility. Like this is an election season. And, and this is the thing that divides us the most culturally, if you think about it. And it bleeds into racist ideas, and it bleeds into all kinds of things, and we attach all kinds of things. And there's all kinds of people that want to use that division for their power. No matter what side of the aisle you want to sit on. And you think about, like, like, the church should stay out of that. You'll never hear us stand up and tell you how you should vote, man, because we're children of the kingdom of God. We're kingdom people. We're not of this world, right? We're not regarding things according to the flesh. We're beyond that. Now, we know we could draw a crowd. If we wanted to pick one side or the other, we could fill up a room full of people who, like, cheer it on, whatever. But that's not representing the kingdom of God. Think think about this. If our ministry is reconciliation, why would we want to stand up and proclaim a political party's ideology? If our our ministry is reconciliation. And think about this, because I I just love this. Think about this. Like, if you actually looked at how people voted, our country's basically split 50-50. And so if our responsibility is to, to reach everybody in our community, and we pick one side or the other, we're basically saying we're just going to do half our job. And I don't care about the rest. And that's not kingdom-minded. That's not a ministry of reconciliation. So we have to understand we live beyond the things of this world. We're not trapped by this world. Why? Because key point number three, Jesus adopts us into God's family. It's not just that we've been given a ministry of reconciliation, that we've been given peace and we're reconciled. We're actually children of God. We have access in one spirit, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We have been given access through this one spirit to literally become children of the father. Adoption is so beautiful. Like it literally gives the kid like all the rights of a blood-born child, right? Like you have all the rights, all the inheritance and all the responsibility of being a kid. You know, so when you come into a household, like you get all the benefits and one day mom and dad are going to, are going to be gone and there's going to be stuff that you can inherit. But in the meantime, somebody needs to take out the trash and guess what? It's your job, right? You get all the benefits of being with mom and dad, being part of the family, being a sibling, being a brother, being a sister. But there's also a responsibility of being part of a household. And sometimes we have to do our part. Sometimes you got to serve in Kids Quest. You know, sometimes you got to serve as a greeter. 
Like, we're growing. We need a lot more people to do that. So sometimes, like, being a part of the family of God is a call to action. It's a call to mission. It's a call to work. It's a call to do the thing. But then there's all the benefits that come with being a part of the family of God. I've been studying a lot on Roman history lately. Think about this. This is something that's fascinating me. And so when the Roman aristocracy, like in the, in the most important families and, and like the stories of, of how the Roman uh, emperors rose and fell and how all that took place and their, their, their movement towards a republic and then there was all this stuff. It's fascinating. But through that all, what they would do is then the, in the rich families and the powerful and influence, fa- influential families, they would take, while somebody was alive, they would take beeswax and they would make a mask of that person's face. And when you walked into that family's household, there would be a wood cabinet there with all these masks hanging there. And the children of that family, they were taken to this this case, and they would look at all the masks, and they would tell the kids, like, here's Uncle Joe, and here's what Uncle Joe did. You need to know what Uncle Joe did, right? Here's Uncle Leroy. Here's what Uncle Leroy did. You need to do what Uncle... And they had to know what all the uncles and all the aunts and all the ancestors, they had to know the history of all those masks. And then whenever there was a funeral in the family, the children would put on those masks and they would walk as if they were representing that person at this funeral. You think about that. You've been brought into the family of Jesus. And you better know what he did. Do you know what he taught? Do you know what the Gospels say about him? Do you know, have you ever read what he actually said? Have you read his sermons, read what he taught, read how he interacted? Like, you should know, like, everything, like, all the things, yes, it's just death and resurrection, yes. But, like, do you know, like, all the accomplishments of Jesus, the things, like, do you know the heart of Jesus? So that when you, you can literally walk and put on the mask of Jesus and walk into this faith and represent this family that now you've been grafted into. And you represent Jesus. And so we walk into the world in the mask of Jesus, living out what the legacy of this family of faith is that we've been given access to. And it's beautiful. So our next step this morning is to accept Jesus invitation. Walk into the family of faith. Put on the mask of Jesus. The biggest step that we can take this morning with this for some of you is to be baptized. And if you've never been baptized and you call yourself a follower of Christ, I just encourage you to think about taking that next step this morning. Because here's why. When we do baptism, it's the symbolism, that new creation that we read about earlier. So when you become a new person in Christ, you're literally burying your old self and raising to walk as a new creature in Christ. And that's what the symbolism of baptism is. It's not just for you. It's a proclamation to everybody who might witness it that in you, you you have seen something that nobody else has seen, right? And that other followers of Jesus have joined with you in this, but now you see a hope and a new family and a a kingdom mindset has now entered into your, your thought process. So now you are somebody new, You are a new creation. You're not the old person. So you're now your ideas, your your philosophies of life begin to shift and change towards what God would have. And you begin to think differently and you're walking into this new life. And so baptism is a representation of the beginning of that journey. That God is taking me on this journey of something new. And I'm entering into this beautiful tapestry and this beautiful story that God is writing. So if you're interested in baptism as your response today, uh, Logan, our next sense pastor, is going to be right over here at this little table where the, where the lamp is. So you can go and you can talk to Logan during our response time, but also after the service is over, everybody else is headed this way, you can head that way. Walk in courage and in faith today. Accept Jesus' invitation to be a part of the family of faith. Let's respond. Let's move, right? When God's calling you, let's move. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the invitation into your family, into the kingdom of Jesus, into this thing that is eternal, that awakens something in us that was dead.
Father, in this moment, I pray that you stir in the hearts that need to be stirred. That your spirit beckons loudly. And that we respond with boldness and courage. And we accept the invitation of Jesus to be a part of your family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you guys to stand as we move. Like this, this might be a moment for you to respond by going and having somebody pray with you at our prayer corner or go to the cross and pray. Pray a prayer of confession. Like we talked about the labels last week. Maybe you've been putting labels on people and maybe you want to kind of pray through that and ask God to forgive you and show you a path forward. If you want to be baptized, make a move today to respond.